Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Jordan Rudder, Director of Communications at American Bird Conservancy. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel afterward. We'll be putting the links referenced in the chat, but in case you miss them or can't copy them down fast enough, please know that everything can be found in a follow-up email we'll send to registrants and on our website. Please submit any questions you have during the presentation using the Q&A box, and we'll try to answer as many of those at the end during the Q&A portion of the show. Um, please know that animated, uh, automated captions are available during this webinar, and you can turn them on by clicking on the up arrow next to the CC icon and clicking on show subtitles. You can then drag them wherever you want on the screen. Before we begin, I wanted to share some background about American Bird Conservancy, shortened to ABC. It was founded in 1994 with the mission of protecting wild birds and their habitats across the Americas. And we continue that work today following a conservation strategy outlined by the pyramid featured on the current slide. Our work strives to keep common birds common and prevent the rare species from going extinct. And bird conservation works. Species and groups of birds have rebounded in the past decades, but it doesn't happen without people like you who care about birds. So thank you again for joining our webinar today. Today's webinar topic is all about the Farm Bill. But that title may be a little bit misleading because while farms are definitely a huge part of this bill, there are lots of other types of habitat, people, and even birds involved. This $500, $500 billion, dollar, so that with a B, piece of legislation is the largest single source of conservation funding in the world. It has helped conserve and restore millions of acres of bird habitat across the United States. And that's why later in the webinar, you'll learn about some birds and habitat projects that ABC is doing with support from the Farm Bill. These include projects that might not immediately come to mind when you think farm. For instance, a cerulean warbler habitat conservation effort in the forests of the Appalachian Mountains. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers. We have Steve Riley, who is ABC's Director of Farm Bill Policy. He comes to ABC from Ducks Unlimited, where he served as the Assistant Coordinator for the Northern Great Plains Joint Venture. He also previously served as the Conservation Delivery Specialist for the Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture. Policy is a passion of Steve's, and he has a lot of experience collaborating with partners and agencies on policy needs and in providing leadership for policy efforts. Robert Perez is conservation coordinator at the Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture. A South Texas native, Robert retired from Texas Parks and Wildlife in 2021. With nearly 30 years of experience as a wildlife professional, he has led strategic planning efforts and has contributed to the design and implementation of numerous national, regional, and state initiatives and plans. Robert holds both a bachelor's and master's degree in biology from Texas State University, where his master's work focused on the survival of wild and pen-raised northern bobwhite. Seth Coffey is a fifth-generation agricultural producer operating the Honey Creek Edge Rock Ranch in Springer, Oklahoma with his family. He holds a bachelor's degree in rangeland ecology and agricultural business and a master's in fire ecology from Oklahoma State University. He currently serves as the president of the Arbuckle Rangeland Restoration Association and in the Arbuckle Conservation District Board of Directors. And last but not least, we have Amanda Duran, Director of Conservation Partnerships for the Appalachian Mountains Joint Venture. She first joined ABC and AMJV in 2015 as the Pennsylvania Cerulean Warbler Appalachian Forest Enhancement Partnership Coordinator before becoming the AMJV Habitat Delivery Coordinator in 2018. She graduated from the University of Delaware with a master's in wildlife ecology and a bachelor's from Pennsylvania State University in environmental resource management. First up, we're gonna have Steve talk about the Farm Bill in general and some great background information for all of us. So Steve, if you wanna get set up. Good afternoon, folks. I'm gonna to switch to my PowerPoint and we'll see what happens there. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Should be good now. You're good to go. All right, so today I'm going to talk about our uh, our farm bill uh, platform, getting ready for the 
the deliberations on uh, this farm bill. Farm bills are about, they tend to last for about five years. The current one will uh, cease to be authorized September 30th. So Congress is in the process of building a new, uh, a new farm bill. And as Jordan said, it's uh, gonna be about a half a trillion dollar bill uh, with a lot of different things in it. One, one part, actually a fairly small part is the conservation title of the farm bill. Uh, this is the first time that ABC has had its own platform, though we've been involved with Farm Bill in the past. So part of what you need to know uh, that leads to this, why are we, why are we doing this? Uh, well, nature's trying to tell us something. We've lost half of the grassland birds in the last uh, 50 years, uh, and uh, we continue to see those uh, populations uh, go down. Most of the bird populations have gone down. It's just that grassland birds, I'm kind of pointing out that they're, uh, they've gone down more precipitously than most of the other birds. And also they tend to be where we have uh, farmers and ranchers. Um, and so we'll talk about that a little bit more. Right now there are about 70 species of birds that are on the tipping point, meaning that if they drop much further, they'll be in the category of threatened or endangered uh, and so we need to do some things to start turning the tide. So to add to that challenge, uh, a lot of the land that we're working on is privately owned land. And historically, we've done more, uh, more conservation work in publicly owned lands, but we don't really have that uh, luxury uh, dealing with uh, grassland birds, farmland related birds, because they tend to live uh, on private lands or at least on lands that if there are incorporated public lands, as you see a lot out west, they're still under pretty much private control. Um, and so in order to, to deal with that, we really got to rely on landowners to make different choices about how they farm and ranch, and hopefully we can do some things to help them uh, make those choices a little more palatable. It's a little bit, we're kind of dealing with in the grassland landscape, as well as the other landscapes, we're dealing with, a, a, with ecosystems that are just kind of fraying like a, like a fabric. We've tended to use this uh, analogy uh, of a, a tattered fabric to, to kind of get people to think about what's going on out there. It's not just the birds that you know uh, around you. It's most of the birds that are not real generalists that, that thrive around people. Uh, most of them are in declines. And most of the reason they're in declines is because of habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation. So what can we do about it? Well, there are only so many things we can do. We can learn and share through science and education uh, what's right and how to get it done. We can expect people to do the right thing. Uh, and to a certain degree, we can expect that to happen. We call that a duty of care. But as you know, a lot of times people don't do the right things, uh, particularly if it tends to cost them a lot of money. If these farmers and ranchers are trying to send their kids to college like everybody else. Uh, and uh, to some of the things we need them to do cost a lot of money. And and need some help and that brings the farm bill to bear. So other things that we can do are to regulate unwanted behavior. That's not really something that most of us on this call can uh, do anything about. Uh, we're talking about fines and other kinds of sanctions, but what we can do is incentivize the desired behaviors that we wanna see. And one of the best ways to do that is through the farm bill. So why the farm bill? Well, there's lots of money for TA, which is technical assistance. This is providing guidance to producers, one-on-one -on -one explaining how to do things. Uh, and there's also a lot of FA, we call that, which is financial assistance uh, to help do that. Um, also, the Farm Bill has a lot of infrastructure set up. Many uh, of our counties have uh, USDA offices and they have staff there. They have systems in place through programs and various uh, aspects of those programs to, uh, to work with producers to, to improve the landscape. And they also have uh, USDA vast existing partnerships 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that with the joint ventures, but ABC in general uh, has lots of partnerships with USDA to help try to implement uh, aspects of the farm bill. So uh, our top priorities within our, uh, our uh, farm bill platform that we call Bird Saver, want to get something a little catchy there, but we really want to in improve incentives for Western, Western ranchers particularly, but other grassland owners to improve those grasslands where we already have existing grasslands. It's a lot cheaper to do that. And we can do some things like resting pastures to improve the structure and the quality of the habitat that the birds use. And we can pay for them to do that. We also want to uh, influence USDA to improve the way they work with uh, non-government organizations like ABC to help deliver conservation capacity to work directly with the producers, not necessarily focusing on soil conservation or water conservation, which is kind of the bread and butter of USDA, but really helping them to focus more on uh, wildlife conservation, bird conservation, and rangeland conservation to improve those habitats. The other One of the other things that we want to do, and I, I will say our bird saver platform is a lot of things and we'll share a, a, a broader version of that. But the other one of our top priorities is to strengthen kind of the granddaddy of all of our uh, conservation programs out there, the conservation reserve program, and make that stronger and hopefully bigger. So really in a nutshell, uh, ABC is working uh, and wants to work with you to uh, build a better strong bill, uh, farm bill uh, and to help bring back grassland birds, forest birds, and all the other birds that are out there that are in decline. I think we have time at this point for uh, a few uh, questions, but maybe we're waiting on that. I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, that was a great overview. If folks wouldn't mind putting their questions in the chat or the Q&A box, we'll collect those and ask them at the end. Um, so thank you again, Steve. And next up is Robert, who will be presenting. So Robert, if you want to come on screen and share. Great. Take it away. All right. Hello. Yeah. Um, Robert Pettis, great to be with you guys today. Thanks for taking the time to stop in and hear a high level view of what we're doing with Oaks and Prairie's joint venture related to the Farm Bill. Um, as Steve mentioned, there's a number of different programs that ha can have an impact on working lands, private lands to impact declining grassland birds. Um, so the Oaks and Prairies is one of 24 joint ventures across North America, uh, Canada, US, and Mexico. And we're, we're all our own um, mini partnerships, self-directed collaborative partnerships, partners, the key word, and um, really focused on conserving habitat for birds and wildlife and people, really focused on birds. But what we bring to the table is strategic thought. And so really basing our actions in science and guided by science and what's best and most appropriate to help um, all birds. There's a colored map with all the joint ventures in North America. We're right there, Oaks and Prairies in Texas and Oklahoma. And we're um, relatively young. Some of the joint ventures have been around for a long time. We've only been around since 2008 and all birds are what we try to conserve and work to help but really we only have so many employees and so much time in a day and we put a lot of our efforts into these declining grassland birds specifically because we don't really have a lot of wetlands in our geography for waterfowl but we do have a whole lot of grasslands and um, focus on those within the oaks and prairies kind of uh, ecosystems in texas and oklahoma and also the edwards plateau which is kind of central texas and so one of the things that was kind of an idea at the back of a truck at a tailgate one day several years ago was talking about what can we do what kind of program can we kind of build and get people excited to do on the ground work to help birds to help these um you know, reach these population goals and to really help those we thought you know it would be good to have something that's easy and uh, we started this grasslands restoration incentive program with a kind of a broad partnership and it's grip and so the thinking was get a grip on native grasses, get a grip on grasslands. And this kicked off in late 2013. And we wanted folks to really 
kind of have ownership and be able to navigate the complicated, really, process of applying for and getting USDA funds to the Farm Bill, working with private lenders to get those programs on their lands. It can be tedious. It can be confusing. And so we wanted to work with our private landowners and stewards and help them kind of get through, get to these programs and move the needle for conservation and really start to impact folks kind of behavior and how they view the resources. There's so many acronyms with the Farm Bill and different programs. And so it's USDA Farm Bill, but there's the NRCS side of it and there's the Farm Service Agency. Um, but really, it's really about what can you do? What are the actions that are gonna restore or enhance uh, native grass and habitat. So here's a list of seven of them that we kind of rolled in this program. They've got a long, long, long list. We just focused on those things that were, we felt could really have the greatest benefit to grassland birds. So brush management, prescribed burning, prescribed grazing, these sorts of things uh, to help those species. From 2017 to 22, we had a real big win and had a regional conservation partnership program or RCPP that uh, we applied for and were awarded and that was a real game changer for us because it really allowed us to grow our program the grip program from here and there a little bit of funding state funding to those really larger pools of money that steve riley was talking about that really they have the op the the, the resources to really make an impact at a biome wide scale and so this model is a great one because it brings people together uh, we all leverage each other's resource and we're all kind of rolling in the same direction to do something on the landscape um, so that was a 2.6 million agreement and uh, it allowed us to hire some staff and to work directly with landowners and really start to get things uh, on the ground here recently that one expired but we have a new one starting uh, right now we're in agreement phase trying to get that so moving forward we'll have one in texas uh, starting hopefully sometime mid-summer. But why? where do you work? That's one of those questions in talking about the science. We chose counties where bird populations are declining, but they have a high likelihood of being recovered and we focus our efforts. And so that leading edge of decline to stem those losses for birds like Northern Bobwhite, Painted Bunning, Eastern Meadowlark, Dick Sissel, and we wanted to look at the human ends aspect of it and include human dimensions work in some of these counties. And so it's basically 30 counties in Texas and 10 in Oklahoma, where we try to concentrate those resources, concentrate our efforts and working with partners to make a difference on the landscape. Um, really, my take home message is for us to be effective in doing what we're doing and to help the birds, we really want to keep working lands working. Uh, that's a really important part of keeping those systems functioning and healthy and benefiting the air we breathe, the water we drink, and all of us, not just the birds, but it's, it, it benefits us all to keep working lands working. And uh, these grasslands, you know, really help us increase our bottom line, shaping those behaviors, as I mentioned, but also trying to get permanent adoption of benefic beneficial practices, because when grasslands are healthy, cattle operations can actually see better weight gains, uh, better water infiltration, better soil health. There's all sorts of upside to working through these programs, through the Farm Bill and other programs to really make an impact out there on the landscape for, for us all. And it's and, and really want to focus on that sustainability. And I think that's all that I've got. That was a quick overview. I think I'm right on time. You're going to get a lot of questions at the end, Robert, but that was awesome. Yeah, such important work. So thank you. Um, we are, as I mentioned, going to save the questions till the end, though. So, Robert, if you want to um, stop sharing your screen and Seth, you come back on. Um, friendly reminder to our audience that we are recording this webinar and we'll be sure to send a follow up email with all of this information and links and things like that as well. So keep an eye out for that. But Seth, if you want to share your screen. Hello everyone, how are you all today? <clears throat> um, my name is uh, Seth Coffey and I'm with the uh, Edge Rock Ranch in Honey Creek. It's kind of two ranches combined into one. So this is, I'm a fifth generation rancher here in Oklahoma and we currently use uh, farm bill programs um, in our daily operations. And so it's been extremely helpful for us and what we do and how we manage. 
Yes, I have to forgive me. I'm trying to get yep. over here. I'm gonna get this out here. Let me try this. Oh, where'd it go? Right here. Perfect. Okay. So this is my family. Um, this is my great or my grandfather, Fred, and then here's my wife and I, and my brother and his wife, and uh, my father and mother and sister and brother. And this is kind of our family and where we live. We live in um, Ardmore, Oklahoma, and that's where our ranch is located. Um, we're in the Arbuckle Mountains, and so uh, it's Arbuckle Mountains. They're known for their uh, tombstone topography. And so if you noticed on that init initial picture, it was a grassland that had been, been burnt off. And so um, therefore, when you burn that grass off, it really exposes the rock. And you could actually you know, walk out to a row of rocks and turn left, and they'll be lined up like a tombstone. And so we have a lot of... Um, geographic challenges, I think, that are pretty unique to us that we deal with in our day-to-day -day operations um, that make it pretty costly for us to uh, be able to do um, conservation work and, and even mechanical and brush treatment. Um, and so <clears throat> in our ranch, um, we are a, a traditional beef cow operation. Um, I would think one thing that we try to do is we manage our ranch as, it's, as an ecological system. And so um, we try not to have a single species approach, but more of it being a living, breathing thing all on its own. And, you know, if we are managing for, you know, all species together, I, you know, and in a way that is helpful for the environment, everybody benefits. And so for us, you know, our cow herd will benefit, grassland birds and the wildlife will benefit and hopefully our rangeland too. Um, we are pretty aggressive with our prescribed fire um, program, and um, <clears throat> and we also um, allow for rest periods uh, throughout the year um, as we're grazing our cow herds through. Um, so this is just kind of some of the wildlife and uh, and cattle that you can see there as we're rolling through. Um, another thing that's really important to us is the Honey Creek. So Honey Creek is a it's, it's a, uh, a spring that flows year round that flows down to Turner Falls Park, which is a park that's managed by the city of Davis. And it's kind of one of their big revenue streams is a city. I mean, it's kind of our own little version of Niagara Falls, but right here in Oklahoma. And so for us, it's really important um, that we manage very carefully and in an ecological approach. And, and more importantly, you know, we try to steer clear of of chemicals where we can because I, you know, we couldn't live with ourselves if that ended up getting into that stream and, and harming other people. And so for us, you know, water is very crucial and it's still our limiting factor in our day-to-day -day operation. Um, some of the programs that we've used are uh, GRIP. Um, at Cole Fagan and Ken G were the first to kind of come to me and uh, help uh, walk me through how that program would go. Um, this picture down here on the right uh, with the bulldozer, that's something that uh, we're working on currently where we're pushing out um, eastern red cedars or actually ash juniper is what we have to deal with on a day to day basis uh, because we're on top of the limestone rock. But um, it's been very helpful for us and for me, it's allowed our family to um, hopefully reach our conservation goals a little bit faster and in a little more timely manner. Um, funds are often can be constrained in the cattle industry from year to year, and you don't always have a lot of money to, um, you know, target invasive species such as eastern red cedar. And so, it's been extremely helpful for us um, on that. <clears throat> the next one that we've used uh, throughout history was the conservation stewardship plan. Um, for me, I, you know, I liked it, but then it, the way that the policy was written, it made it very difficult. Um, to implement in your day-to-day -day strategy as a rancher. Uh, they had definitely had like specifics, like instead of burning a third of your ranch where well, you had to burn a third of each pasture. Well, for us, that was extremely difficult to do because of, you know, the terrain and the topography. And so, you know, we've kind of shifted our management since then. And now we're burning, say, one whole burn unit every three years. And we're shifting our burn units around, but we're not trying to target, you know, a scale that's so small in that pasture that, you know, we end up har harming other pastures in the process, trying to get everything to line up. And these are, this is just kind of an example over here on the right of some of the things that CSP 
would require you to do in order to uh, gain that money from the government. And uh, these are kind of things that most, most ranchers in today's time should be doing all of these things already. Um, I'm sure that there's a few out there that are new to ranching that may not be aware of rotational grazing, rotating your mineral tubs, uh, monitoring your forage growth and making sure that your carrying capacity you know, and grazing plan match you know, uh, your forage production on your ranch. But CSP is a great way, or was for you know ranchers to get introduced, new ranchers to get introduced to that process, and how it would work. And the last one that we've tried and that we're currently doing, this is the first time, is EQIP. It's the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Um, again, it's a way for us to just kind of move the needle a little bit more on our um, cedar issue that we have to deal with in our day-to-day -day operation. Uh, I would say one thing uh, to keep in mind when dealing with EQIP is you know, unless you really have your costs nailed down as far as, you know, what it's going to cost you to remove an acre of cedar trees, you know, you got to be careful for how much you sign up with and, and that, you know, it's not going to end up costing you more than maybe you have available in your budget. And so, again, it's always know your costs before you sign up for something so that that way <clears throat> you can complete the project and you win and it's also a win for conservation. And this is kind of an example of what the project's going to look like this coming year. So in the green here, these are just some uh, moderately encroached areas with cedar trees. And then in the blue are going to be 100% cedar canopy forest that we're going to come in and target. We've kind of switched it up. You know, the way that the policies are kind of written right now, you have to kill every cedar within, you know, this red burn unit. Well, you know, for us, we're more targeting, you know, what's in these thickets and then hopefully you know we get our fire guards cleaned up and we can maintain this area with fire in years to come for us it's more about getting a safe fire guard and a safe fire break so that you can more effectively manage that pasture as opposed to just targeting one small scale spot uh, the other thing that i feel like our uh, our uh, ecological approach gives us is a lot of biodiversity and heterogeneity within our pastures um, that's, you know, for you know, habitat for bobwhite quail and the eastern meadowlarks, that, which are the two birds that we typically come in contact, I would say, uh, pretty often in our day-to-day -day operation. Uh, I think that how we manage works well. We, we get a lot of flowers at different times of the year. Um, we definitely get, you know, your tall, wolfy grass plants for uh, birds to nest in. And it's also good for the cattle, too. And so it's a kind of a win for everybody. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at, or that's the end of my presentation. So if there's any questions, please don't hesitate to ask or open book. That was awesome. Thanks so much, Seth. And there are questions coming in. And if folks have more questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. So Seth, think about what else you wanna share. Um, but in the meantime, again, last but not least, we'll have Amanda Duran. And you're all set. Take it away. Hi, thanks, Jordan. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And I'm excited to share with you how uh, American Bird Conservancy is using Farm Bill uh, funding to help create habitat for the cerulean warbler. Uh, the cerulean warbler Appalachian Forest Land Enhancement Project was funded through a Farm Bill program called the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Um, and the project results that I'm going to share with you today took place between 2015 and 2020 in the states highlighted on the map here on the slide. And the project was focused on working with private landowners to manage their land to create or improve habitat for the cerulean warbler. We did that through three different pathways. Uh, forest management in the states that are shown here on the map in green. Uh, legacy surface mine reforestation in the, in the state shown in orange, and with conservation easements in Pennsylvania. Uh, in my time today, I'm going to focus on the forest management and legacy surface mine reforestation um, that we were able to accomplish with private landowners during this project. But first, um, why cerulean warblers? Um, despite the male of the species having this bright blue coloration, the cerulean warbler might be one of the most elusive birds to see in the Appalachians. 
Um, however, about 80% of the entire cerulean warbler population breeds within um, the Appalachian Mountains, um, which makes it one of the species of highest concern for us here in the region. Unfortunately, across most of its range, the species has been declining at a rate of about uh, one per one and a half percent per year. Another way to think of that is that over the last 50 years or so, about 70 percent of the cerulean warbler population, or more than a million birds, have been lost. Uh, the main reason for this loss um, is the um, decline in um, suitable habitat for the species. That includes both the loss of forest due to development, but more importantly, across most of the range, is that um, there has been a decrease in the quality and suitability of forests for ceruleans. That means that while the forest is remaining, um, while the landscape is remaining forested, the forests are not offering the conditions that cerulean warblers need to successfully raise their, uh, their young and to nest. Uh, many of you might associate cerulean warblers with old forest. And while that's true, um, the specific aspects of old forest that cerulean warblers are attracted to are widely spaced large trees, especially white oaks, and forests that have really high structural complexity. And what that means is that the forest canopy is made up of trees of different heights and it has openings in it that create gaps. And in those gaps, sunlight is able to reach the forest floor and um, create a thick herbaceous layer of plants growing um, on the forest floor in those places. Over time, these features tend to develop in very old forests through natural disturbances like fires or um, storm events. But forest management techniques can actually be used to enhance or create these features in younger forests, attracting cerulean warblers and creating the habitat they need to successfully nest and raise their young. There's also um, a need for forest management practices to help restore degraded forests and put them on the path towards becoming cerulean warbler habitat in the long term. Through this project, we were able to work with private forest landowners across Appalachia to implement practices like tree planting, sustainable harvesting, invasive species control, um, canopy gap creation, and prescribed fire to create or improve habitat um, for the cerulean warbler. These practices often have no commercial value, meaning they're not financially feasible for many landowners without the financial and technical assistance from programs like those offered in the Farm Bill. On average, these types of forest management practices can cost a landowner $500 or more per acre. And the funding offered through the Regional Conservation Partnership Program in the Farm Bill offers landowners an opportunity to invest in their land and to improve its value for ceruleans, but also for other wildlife as well. But through this project, we also wanted to think about ways to create habitat for cerulean warblers over the very long term, and even in areas that are often seen as having a low value for conservation. Uh, part of our project targeted areas that were previously surface mined, and most of these areas were reclaimed prior to being sold to private landowners, but reclamation does not mean that it was returned to the forest that it was before it was mined. Most of these um, surface mine legacy sites um, suffer from extreme soil compaction that limits the ability of trees to grow there. And they're often replanted with non-native grasses and invaded by um, invasive species like autumn olive, um, which is a shrub. So this portion of our project focused on reforesting legacy surface mine sites that were in a highly forested landscape through invasive species removal, deep tillage, which is a practice to be able to break up that um, intense soil compaction, um, and tree planting, of course. And these practices are also very expensive, um, often costing more than $1,500 an acre. And so the funding assistance offered through the farm bill to private landowners is key in allowing this type of work to occur. Overall, in just five years, we had a tremendous impact on the landscape and on the properties of the landowners we were able to work with. Uh, we connected with more than 200 landowners um, and connected them with more than four and a half million dollars in financial assistance from the farm bill. 
These funds were then also matched with nearly an equal amount in contributions from partners, um, especially other nonprofit organizations that allowed us to provide technical assistance to um, the private landowners through foresters and other professionals that help them to plan and implement um, the projects on their land. In all, I'm, I'm really proud to say that we were able to improve 9,609 acres of private forest land for cerulean warblers over the five-year length of this project. Um, we are, though, of course, very interested in knowing if the cerulean warblers are actually benefiting from all this work that we're doing. So we did do some um, follow-up monitoring of our project sites um, in the one to three years after we um, did the treatment there in Pennsylvania and Maryland. And in those states, we found that um, there were cerulean warblers at about 9% of our project sites, which was um, not significantly different than the number of birds we found at untreated sites that we monitored nearby. And um, we think that this is due to a number of reasons. First, excuse me, it's important to remember that the time scale of forest restoration is a long one. It can take years after a treatment for forests to reach the ideal conditions for cerulean warblers. And our sites may not have reached that by even the third growing season after treatment. And also many of the sites we worked on on private lands were highly degraded after many years of past poor management practices. And so while our management is helping to put those forests back on the path to being cerulean habitat in the long term, it might take uh, many decades or even additional treatments before those places become cerulean warbler habitat. We do hope to continue to monitor those sites to track um, not only cerulean warbler use in the future, but also to be able to capture other benefits from this work like improvements to forest health and carbon sequestration. And with that, I'd just like to say a big thank you to the many partners that were involved in this project and especially to our um, private landowner participants. That was wonderful, thank Amanda, thank you. So now we're going to move into our Q&A portion of the webinar. So if Amanda, you could stop sharing your screen and the other presenters could come back on camera. I wanna thank all of our participants for all of your great questions and we'll try to get through as many as we can now. <laughs> so if my presenters are ready, uh, Steve, we're gonna go back to you. Um, and have you kick things off. Um, one of the questions we wanted to ask you is to go a little bit more in depth of what people can do to help support the Farm Bill. You had that great slide about different ways to get involved, and maybe you could just share a little bit more about um, how we can actually get this really important piece of legislation passed. Well, there are some great ways, uh, and ABC and a number of our partners offer various means to uh, engage Congress. Obviously, the Farm Bill is going to be determined uh, first and foremost by your uh, members of Congress, House of Representatives, members, and senators. And so uh, the best way to influence it is to work with those folks, develop relationships with them. And we have a lot of information and systems that can help you do that. So. Uh, we have action alerts uh, that often go out. You can sign up to uh, get those. And when they come out, we often will have a, a uh, kind of a, a template letter that you can build off of and send to your members of Congress pretty easily. Uh, first thing you'll want to do, though, is to take a what we've put together with our Bird Saver platform. There's a two-page version of it. And just uh, take a look at that, familiarize yourself with it. Uh, and uh, and then try to jump in and help us uh, work with the members of Congress to uh, get some things done. Thanks, Steve. So Robert, we're bird people. I wanna talk to you about birds. Um, so you mentioned a few species specifically, some of us, including myself, have them as our backgrounds right now, meadowlark, Steve has bobwhite. Why are those specific species the focal species, and how are they doing? Can you talk to me about the actual um, conservation status of those species like painted bunting and dick thistle that you mentioned? Sure, sure. Yeah, so the great concern there for grassland birds, many birds that are common like meadowlarks and like citizen flycatchers, painted bunting, they've been around a long time and had 
really robust large populations across North America when when in fact the birds can still be seen i think there was a, mag a magazine article 10 years ago audubon came out and the cover was a metal arc and it was um, common species in decline and so what we see is really steep and significant decline specifically in grassland birds so that guild or assemblage of birds is the is the fastest group of birds uh, in north america and so it's very alarming and so although we still can see many of those species and they're not threatened or endangered at this point. Some are, don't get me wrong, some of the birds are threatened and endangered, but as a whole, it's it's uh, very concerning and it's a, it's a challenge and it's based in habitat. And so we have to look at habitat and where that land is and most, a lot, or most, a lot of the grasslands biome is in private land ownership. And so that's why we focus these efforts to work with and on private lands to uh, enhance, conserve, um, restore grassland habitat. Thanks, Robert. Seth, the next question is for you as, as our private landowner. Um, we wanna know a little bit more about how other private landowners can get involved and be supported and take advantage of some of the programs that you mentioned. Um, you shared that you have a lot of really important acreage, but how could someone with a smaller property, um, say just a few dozen acres or so get involved? Do you have any tips for them? Um, I would say that the first thing you could do is march down to your local USDA NRCS office and develop a relationship with those individuals and the people that are also on those conservation district boards. Uh, they're the ones that are going to be overseeing the projects, taking a look at them, and uh, ultimately they'll be the ones who decide whether or not it goes through. And, but I would say, yeah, personally, the NRCS, that's a, just been a crucial relationship for us. And they really help us to even make us aware of what programs are out there that we could even take advantage of or even might be eligible for. Thanks, Seth. And Amanda, on that note, since you work with private landowners or owners as well, what would you say the average um, lot size that you're working with is? Hmm. Um, well, I would just start off by saying that there's no minimum size of a property to work with NRCS. Um, so there's certainly no limitation to um, say you have to have at least this many acres to be able to work with us. Um, there are certainly benefits to having a larger landscape, especially for species like cerulean warbler, um, where if we are able to have projects that are, you know, 10 acres in size or larger, we might see um, more responses from certain species. But there are certainly things that you can do down to having um, smaller acreages than even 10 acres to work on. So there's there's lots you can do no matter what size property you have. Awesome. And then Amanda, could you just keep going kind of with the theme of, again, you know, people like me that have no acreage to offer, um, but want to be supportive, um, you know, are we looking for sustainably managed forest products or are there kind of other steps along the way to kind of have that support um, once you actually change the landscape for birds for the better? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say that uh, generally just recognizing that forest management when done sustainably can benefit bird populations. That's a very important message to share with others that love birds, to make sure that people understand that, that when done correctly, forest management is a very valuable tool in helping to um, rebound declining bird populations and to improve the habitat um, available for birds, especially um, in the Appalachians where, where I'm located. Um, but as, in terms of what you can do um, in when purchasing products. Um, there are certification organizations. Um, one that ABC works with very closely is the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. So you can um, look for um, the certification from that organization on products, everything from tissue boxes to lumber. And so in order to get that certification, the um, producer of that product has to um, meet a number of different standards indicating that it was produced sustainably. And ABC is also working with um, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative to help understand how managed forests can benefit birds and how we can increase the benefits um, to priority bird species. So I would say to just to think about um, as a consumer, 
looking for products that are produced sustainably and in a way that can benefit birds is, is something that anyone can do. Thanks, Amanda. Um, Seth, we're going to go back to you because we have a lot of questions wanting more details and stories from your, your family and your, and your ranch. Um, so one of them, one of the questions is, uh, can you explain what wildlife friendly fences are? Uh, yes. So the way it was explained to me is that um, we'd go through different parts of our ranch where we have fences that maybe wildlife couldn't cross through. And so what I would have to do once a year is depending on where the cows were at and what fence, fences we had planned for that year, I'd actually take those wires and um, you'd undo it from the fence posts and bind them all together. You know, one, one wire would be about a foot off the ground and then the top two wires, we have five strand, you know, would kind of hang about halfway, but it would allow wildlife to freely pass through the fence, um, you know, without running into it. Now, the one funny thing is that really we don't have pronghorn where we're at. So all the white-tailed deer population, they just jump right over the fence. And I think that program was supposed to be geared more towards, I think, pronghorn or antelope because they go under a fence, as I recall. Um, but that was my understanding of it. Thanks. So wildlife and cows, um, this is, I'm going into the next question, uh, need shade. So why, why are you focusing on removing cedar trees specifically? So, um, as you know, we're in the Southern Great Plains and historically it would have burned every three to five years. If you look at that uh, uh, Guyette and Stoddard map, as I recall. And so, um, consequently, in, you know, after World War II in the 1940s, this area had a flush of military equipment and all the fire departments were like, hey, we want it. And they got it. And what happened was we got so effective at putting fires out that it allowed for cedars to encroach into grasslands where they were not historically. And so if you look at photos of our area around statehood, which would have been in 1907, you'll see cedar trees, but they're only in and around like right next to river banks, or they're gonna be on a rock cliff where fire couldn't get to them. Once we took that away, you know, fire, cedars defense to fire is producing hundreds of thousands of seeds per year. So now we've got nothing to get rid of that seed source and it's just allowed them to exponentially expand onto the landscape um, here in Southern Oklahoma. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that was great. Um, and I guess just the last one for right now is kind of, can you speak about the impact of weather where you are right now? And then I'll have- both Actually, people. so yeah. yeah, that's kind of a question I've had and I see your metal arc there behind you and you know, that's what Cole and I were talking about. Um, I guess two years ago, we had that, the freeze that in my house, it, we basically were below freezing for a solid two weeks, two and a half weeks of, you know, February. And I've never seen anything like that in our area. But um, what was interesting to me is unfortunately all of the dead birds that were at all the watering tanks. So what we would do is, you know, we go through our livestock and we'll bust ice for all the livestock twice a day, once in the morning, and then once in the evening, and then the wildlife and everything are going to be coming through during that day. But it was, you know, it was shocking to me how many animals didn't make it through that weather event. And it was, you know, a weather event that typically doesn't happen in our area. And so it's really sad uh, to see that. But I would say the weather has um, definitely has an effect on us um, from year to year. Yeah. Thank you. And Robert and Steve, do you want to chime in just from that larger geographic regional scale? Have you noticed any changes both for, for grasslands as a habitat or the birds that you're monitoring and that connection to the farm bill? To climate specifically? Climate? Okay, yeah. So yeah, there's uh, resources and textbooks and folks looking at the impacts of climate change on birds around the world. And uh, what we see is species that are migratory, they have a northern southern distributed breeding, they move and there's and there's species that are resident that don't migrate like the bob white quail behind Steve Riley there. So it's going to have different impacts based on your ability to to move from place to place more efficiently. And so, yes, as climates continue to change and weather shifts and there's different things that it impacts the distributions of the plant communities and the plant communities out there kind of dictate what birds can feed on and what they can use. So there, I think even Audubon or Nature Conservancy, there are some pro, uh, models and projections to go and look at right now online, like how changes in climate will affect 
plants and will affect bird populations in the future. But there's no doubt that it 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 it, it can shift areas that birds are going to favor, and the ones that can migrate can shift along with that. But uh, there's so many variables; it's difficult to really exactly predict what will happen in the future. But we do know that things are happening to these plant communities and to these distributions of birds. Yeah, I just add to that, remember that uh, all the insects that are out there and all of the rest of the, the animals that are out there are, are dependent upon what plants are there. And as we see climate change happen, as Robert indicated, we see the plant community change. And that's going to affect uh, what insects are available as well as what seeds are available for birds. And so those are all big factors. The other thing I'd point out with the with the bobwhite quail uh, beside my head there uh, is that we know that climate change is affecting how they how successful they nest where it's really really hot. Uh, some of that's based on what plants are available for shade, but some of it's just uh, overall heat uh, not allowing them to bring off uh, a clutch of eggs. So. Uh, climate change is definitely a problem, and uh, you know we're, as Robert said, we don't we don't know enough about it, but we know it's causing issues for us. Thank you, um, Steve. Maybe you could consider continue. Are there certain uh, parts of the farm bill or other incentives, either through the farm bill directly or Robert or Amanda, you could jump in that really get at um, kind of preparing areas for these weather events. Um, one of the questions that came in was also just talking about more specifically about those incentives mentioned. Um, is it just money? Is it work? Is it seeds? So Steve, maybe you could jump in first. Yeah, I think one of the things that we can do uh, right off the bat that we focus a lot of attention on uh, and what we try to drive the farm bill towards is uh, native plant communities that are healthy native plant communities. They're going to be uh, better suited uh, to provide the kind of resilience we need uh, to kind of combat uh, climate change. It, it's gonna affect some of those species, but uh, sticking with the natives is really important. That's, a, that's the, the basis of most of our work. Um, so I, I guess I, I'd leave it at that. If we have native plant materials, we're gonna have native insects, we're gonna have the other native plant food sources that'll support all of the ver vertebrate uh, animals that, uh, that live there, whether they're migratory or uh, more importantly, if, they, if they're non-migratory. Jordan, I could add a little to that. Um, yeah. So the different programs and how, how they help, they're not all monetary. Some of it, as Steve, as Steve mentioned earlier, is TA, which is technical assistance. I know we have a lot of acronyms, but to the financial or technical and lots of organizations besides Farm Bill and RCS offer technical assistance. So your state wildlife agency, Nature Conservancy, American Bird Conservancy, all the joint ventures, um, um, the Audubon, and there's lots of resources out there that can help you with how to restore uh, prairie type grasses on your land. Um, and as far as funding mechanisms, it's not just the NRCS and the Farm Bill that, that helps address some of these issues. Uh, Seth was talking about cedar coming out because of uh, fire. That, that's that's health and human safety. And there are incentives out there to uh, reduce uh, uh, wildfire risk. And so there's incentives to go out there and work with landowners to reduce those wildfire risks for the sake of health and human safety. Uh, there are other programs that reduce the amount of, of volatile fuels on the ground. And so uh, climate and, and then drought insurance, and Seth knows this, I mean, the best way you can have your in resilience be better is to have a functioning ecosystem where you've got a plant community there that's holding water on the ground and, and keeping it there and not running off and having soil erosion and things that can that cause cause compaction or complicate that system and so i think uh resilience is a, is a very important part of it and it does not have to be only a financial incentive but there's definitely folks that can work with you and talk with you about um how to keep those systems healthy and functioning that was a great addition, Robert. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that came in was asking about uh, support and interest by different private landowners in the conservation and bird aspect of the farm bill. So um, for our ABC folks like Amanda and Steve and Robert, maybe, you know, do you find that the people that you're working with are really passionate about this or is there a need to keep doing outreach? And maybe Seth, Seth, why don't you start if 
you don't mind with some of your um, neighbors and colleagues and you know is this is this a widespread known thing that we're all part of or is it um, something that we need to do more and could you rephrase that just one quick one more time uh, are your neighbors and friends and fellow ranchers really involved and engaged with the bird conservation aspect so so we definitely have a few neighboring ranches that that actively are um, and they're going to be more involved primarily with the NRCS. Um, Coles definitely does a good job at getting out there and uh, meeting with landowners and you know in, in Oklahoma you know we're kind of probably one of the reddest states in the nation and so when you mention government programs people you know they'll start cutting their eyes at you looking sideways but um, for us, and you know, I always try to speak positively because for us, it's really been allowed us to be able to um, uh, target, you know, our uh, conservation efforts more quickly and effectively instead of, you know, going out there for years trying to trying different things until you find something that uh, works. Thanks, Seth. Robert and Amanda, you work with private landowners. What would you say the engagement level is like? Um, yeah, I think that I am always pleasantly surprised by how much wildlife, especially birds, um, bring people to the table in terms of wanting to improve their, their property. And especially with forests, it, it often comes down to legacy because a lot of the times the landowners who are going to be doing this work may not necessarily see the benefits in their lifetime because it just takes such a long time when you're working in forested systems to see the results. But so many of them are really inspired by um, hearing about declines in birds or even just through their life experience, seeing that they're noticing they're seeing fewer birds than they used to um, or noticing that there's not as many deer as there used to be. And so wherever you can meet those landowners and what interests them to bring them to the table, um, a lot of them, it's it's sort of this idea of improving the um, the land for future generations. And so that is a, an easy way to, to bring people to the table. Yeah, I just add to that, that, uh, you know, I think that people a lot of times just don't know what they don't know. And uh, farmers and ranchers, a lot of times are exposed to plants and animals every day, and they have been their whole lives. They just don't necessarily have an appreciation for everything. And a lot of times, just helping to uh, nudge that a little bit so that you can talk to them about how special it is that they have these particular plants or animals on their property really helps them to feel more special about that. And I think that, like for all the rest of us, gets the motor running a little bit. And I always like to think about my job being, uh, in part, trying to convey to other people a sense of the land ethic and how they are adopting and that in their own lives. So how, you know, everybody is at some state on a scale of, of you know, one to a hundred, if you will, of what the what their land land ethic is presently. And I, I think of that as kind of a land ethic journey that we're on. And the more we know about the nature and the more uh, we are out in it, the more likely we are to care about it and do something about it. And so that's, you know, encapsulates a lot of what I try to do in my everyday life and and why working on the farm bill is really important because I can help influence that in a real broad way. Well, that was very poignant. Thank you, Steve. Unfortunately, our webinar is actually coming quickly to a close. So I have one final question for all of our presenters. It'll be the same question and we'll go in the order of the presenters. And that question is, what is one thing that you hope everyone takes away from this webinar? So Steve, you're up first. I would uh, say that I hope everyone takes away from this that you can do something about this. You have the power uh, of the the pen and the uh, now the email to uh, contact your members of Congress and ask them to do the right things. And Robert. Yeah, I would uh, that 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 message of keeping working lands working is very important. Those economics are very important to the health of grasslands and to uh, declining grassland birds. And so just to keep that in mind, I think Amanda talked about sustainable products for forestry. There's, you know, grassland, the certified beef, grassland friendly uh, beef. There are things you can do at the supermarket every day to help to help grassland birds as well. So even if you're not a landowner, there are definitely ways uh, to, to help. Thanks, Robert. And Seth? Uh, for me, I think it would be that, uh, you know, 
keep in mind that most most ranchers, I feel like in today's time, have a long term vision in place, and that you know we are managing for future generations, and um, that you know trying to get hung up on a, a single species you know problem, but try to remember that this is a bigger picture. There are a lot of species that are affected by good and bad management, and so try to manage your properties where you can is a whole living, breathing system and not just for one specific item, because you may overlook something that could drastically, you know, negatively affect your operation. Thanks, Seth. And Amanda? I would just say to remember that the farm bill is a lot more than agriculture and working lands are a lot more than farms. So remember that forests are working lands and even though the time scale is a lot different, um, to take that time and make that investment will ultimately benefit birds and, and ecosystems in the end. With all of those wonderful summary notes, we're going to now end the webinar. Thank you so much again to all of our panelists. You are amazing. And thank you to our really wonderful, engaged audience. We so appreciate you. We couldn't do our work and help birds and their habitats without your support. So thank you so much again.